to the Castor Valley Unified School District's first board meeting of the official school year. Welcome. So we are officially calling the meeting to order. And at this time, um, if there are any comments regarding closed session items, this is um, items with conference negotiations with CBTA or CSEA or the personnel report, um, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll be reconvening in about an hour. All right, I do have um, one public comment and I will um, allow Pablo es Espanaz Bananas to um, come on in and we'll give you three minutes to speak. Pablo, are you there? I'm here, hello, how are you? Good, how are you? We're here to give you three minutes for items on closed session. So Amy will start your three minutes and you can proceed. Perfect, let me pull the agenda up here. I mean, it's, I, I'm not gonna take the three minutes at all. Uh, I, I understand you're talking about the negotiations with CBTA and, and CSEA. Uh, I just, uh, through, through the, the conversations, if we can please keep in mind the situation of the in-classroom classified employees that are being uh, told that they have to work in the classroom and, 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 and keeping, please, now that the, the teachers have negotiated that they don't have to be in the classroom, uh, let's, let's try and keep in mind the employees that work in the classroom with the students and, and give them the same, uh, the, the same treatment if possible. And, and that's pretty much the end of my comment. I know there's going to be uh, more comments on this uh, later when, when, when the open, open session happens. But right now, when you guys are going in, I will just uh, see if you can keep that in, in mind. Thank you for your comment, Pablo. I'm going to mute your line. And I do not see any other um, hands raised, so we will, oh, I have one more for public comment before we proceed to closed session. Christy, are you there? Oh, hello. Hi, Christy, are you commenting on closed session items? Um, actually, um, no, I was just logging in to, uh, oh, okay. wait, so you guys are, um, going to be in open session. Uh, we're, we're, um, right now we're, um, opening the meeting and then we're seeing if there are any comments, public comments on closed session items, but we'll be con reconvening, um, at five o'clock. Okay. Great. I'll, I'll be there. Thanks. Thanks. there yeah sorry oh and I did see Robin did you have public comment for closed session items and you're on mute sorry about that <laughs> the floor is yours Robin I do want to say that we stand behind the agreement that we made and ratified. Uh, there has probably been a lot of conversation. Your e email boxes may have exploded in the last few days. It, it was negotiated in good faith and as a starting point. Uh, our members have been informed of that. They are taking it very, with, very hard. Let's just say it that way. Um, and are asking us to come back to the table, which we intend to do. But we do stand on the ratification of the um, memorandum of understanding of July 17th, <laughs> 2020. So uh, that's it. Thank you, Robin. Given that there are no further comments, we will um, 
recess to close session and we will return to open session at five o'clock at the same line. So thank you so much and we will see you at five. I should be good to go. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Castro Valley Unified School District Board Meeting. We are reconvening to open session and we will move to the Pledge of Allegiance. Superintendent Amadi. Ready, set, go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Superintendent Amadi. And I would like to tell the community that we did not make any decision in closed session. And I will move on to the mission statement. Oh, approval of the agenda. Have there been any changes to the agenda? Um, personnel was amended. We'll move approval of the agenda as amended. I'll second. second. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4 0. Mission statement Trustee Theodore. In partnership with the community, Castor Valley Unified School District educates students in a learning environment that is safe nurturing and culturally responsive. Students are guided by excellent inspired staff utilizing innovative instruction, curricula and technology. Thank you, Trustee Theodore. So that everyone is on the line is aware of our public commenting procedure, the board respects and encourages the public to comment on matters on the board agenda and within the board's jurisdiction. The board fully supports civil discourse and requests that everyone respect each other and their point of view. Individuals who would like to address the board must raise your hand during the start of the agenda item. So if there's hands raised that aren't part of that agenda item, we won't take them. But once it starts, that's when you raise your hand. So to comment by video conference, when it's at that agenda item, click the raise your hand button and to comment by phone, raise your hand by pressing star nine to request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comment. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. Individual speakers are asked to limit their comments to no more than three minutes. There are up to 30 minutes of public comment allowed on each agenda item. With board consensus, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed. This meeting is recorded to prepare the official minute. We will move on to item four, California School Employees Association and Castro Valley Teachers Association report. Do we have a uh, representative Robin Fink from CSCA on the line? Not see Robin. Robin she's there. Yeah, she's there. Sorry about that, Robin, and welcome. Quite all right, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm gonna switch over so I can see my notes here. Good afternoon, Superintendent Amadi, board members, parents, students, administrators, union members, and the Castro Valley community that has joined the meeting today. I am Robin Fink. CSE Chapter 52 President. I wish to express my thanks and those of the members of Chapter 52 for the extraordinary leadership and efforts that you have made to facilitate the quantum shift in the education industry that has been our experience this year. In preparing for the 2021 school year, you have dealt with these obstacles as they appeared and proactively to avoid them before they did. 
in my interactions with other chapters in our area and across the state, I have seen demonstrated time and again, no matter how difficult or awkward it seemed, unerringly see Castro Valley Unified was a seriously guiding light leading and accomplishing the plans for moving forward. Yes, circumstances have changed. Of a special mention, or well, have changed in the last year, most definitely. Of special mention was the remediation and accommodation of the state budget cuts to our Castro Valley Unified budget and the adjustments to the adjustments to the adjustments that followed. You found a way to balance that budget without layoffs or decreasing hours for classified employees. We thank you for keeping us in our jobs, employed and whole. Not every district was able to achieve this. We are thankful for what this district has done. To the administrators and district office partners, especially HR, we appreciate and applaud your continuing commitment to making it work, whatever the it is of the moment, and the continued open lines of communication in these very challenging fluid times. We look forward to continuing this work with you soon, like Monday. To the parents, teachers, and other community members, our members thank you as well for your caring, support, trust, and confidence in the work classified employees engage in providing services for your kids. Oh, sometimes we call them our kids. We love our jobs and appreciate your outreach. To the members of Chapter 52 who have reached out to me and to our other chapter board members, your voices are heard and appreciated. It is clear that we still have more work to do, and so we will be heading back to the table on Monday to work with our administrator and district office partners to continue the process. The circumstances have changed, and that allows us the opportunity to come back together and continue the good work of our, our chapter and our district. We have the utmost respect for all our partners and all our members, and we do our best to support the entirety, entire community with our actions, thoughts, and caring. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, ratified the MOU of 717 um, and we wish you all good things as we start crazy town tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. I'm going to mute your line, Robin, yep. and take you off. Thank you, Amy. Do we have our CVTA rep with us today? We do have Mark. Hello, Mark. Hi, guys. Good evening. How is everybody doing? <laughs> Uh, good. Uh, so my address is going to be a little different. Um, the school year starts tomorrow for our 9,000 students. Uh, our leadership team wishes everyone a safe and productive year. Our members have been working hard. Uh, as already mentioned in other addresses, many teachers have been working on curriculum during the summer in anticipation of distance learning. I am happy that CVUSD and CVTA came to an agreement on distance learning schedules and the rest of the MOU. 
We were on the road to wrapping it, wrapping it up when we got the news that 1,600 students signed up for a whole year of Edgenuity or the virtual academies. Edgenuity is pre-purchased company-generated curriculum that is self-paced. It traditionally serves students who benefit from alternative educational models or need credit recovery, and it is a nice alternative to the traditional classroom for a small minority of our student population. When we got the number 1600, this threw everything off and we gave our team and it gave our team serious concerns about how this would impact our teachers and our families. We fear that this model will not serve the approximately 1500 students, which was the most current number I have of families that are committed to it for a full year. The concerns I share and the questions I will pose have already been shared with district personnel, so there should be no surprises by my address. As a result of this district decision, our teachers have had to adjust to being reassigned to different grade levels with very little notice. We have secondary teachers who will have to work both a distance model and also monitor progress and check in with students at Edgenuity. The number of combination classes has exploded at the elementary. We have stipend language for combo classes because they are so difficult to teach during a regular year. Now, even more teachers with only a few days notice are going to have to teach combo classes in a brand new distance model and potentially in a grade that they are not familiar with. Because Edgenuity is self-paced, it is not possible for our teachers to actually teach curriculum if they are placed at the year-round virtual school. Because it is self-paced, a student at high school may finish a semester's worth of work in a month, whereas another student may take the whole semester. So a check-in with students is not for teaching content. In the three weeks since we learned that the district in effect opened a new elementary school and expanded the CVVA to middle school, we offered alternatives to this disruption, including at the last board meeting, the emergency board meeting, when we pleaded that if parents knew they would be on a distance model for a long period of time, it may ease their safety concerns. We also notified the district that surrounding districts are not offering this option for all students. They are opting for the least disruptive option of keeping students in a teacher taught distance model classroom until things move towards in person instruction, whenever they, that might be that, that that may be. I asked the district to check in with Pleasanton, who postponed their edgenuity plans two weeks ago to see if they had a less disruptive disruptive option, yet the district remained committed to edgenuity. I checked in with other local presidents to see if any other districts are doing what CB is doing, and if so, what their signups are like. Most surrounding districts are not doing what Castro Valley Unified is doing. Alameda is the closest. They have 10,000 students and 700 are signed up for the pre-purchased self-paced curricular program. Their president told me the 700 are primarily, primarily medically fragile or live with medically fragile family members. As of today, CV with 9,000 students has 1,490. This has created much more stress for our teachers and site administrators, much more ambiguity, much more confusion, many more involuntary transfers, many more last minute grade and subject changes, a lack of training on other important things because of the panic priority to get teachers to switch. This year will be very difficult and this adds yet another layer. In addition, our team believes that this could lead to regret when parents and students realize that the program they signed up for is 180 days of self-guided, self-paced curriculum, and there may be a mass movement back to the regular distance model, which will cause further difficulties. Again, we offered our concerns. We shared that this was not necessary. We shared that other districts are not doing it because it is not required. I would like to thank those teachers that worked so hard all summer to prepare for their classes. I would like to thank those teachers who took one for the team when their principals pleaded with them to switch to virtual this school year because only a handful of teachers applied, the rest were transferred last week and this week. And to thank and apologize, though out of our control, to those teachers who will be working split classes or pivoting between two different schools. I would also like to apologize to the parents who may find that their child is not being served by this model. I think that what we need now is community and stability, and that is not the feeling I have gotten since this plan was shared with us. Finally, 
I would like uh, to offer just a few questions that the board may want to ask the district leadership team. If the district knew that they did not have to do this, if they knew that other districts walked back their virtual programs, why did they still move forward with theirs? Why, if other school districts, Hayward, Pleasanton, San Leandro, San Lorenzo, New Haven, Piedmont, Fremont, among others, are offering this option to only medical, medically fragile students, why is Castro Valley not doing the same? Why is Castro Valley with their stellar schools, um, or why in Castro Valley with their stellar schools would 1,400 uh, or about 1,500 parents choose the Edgenuity model for a whole year? How many combination classes are there in an average year and how many are there now? Administrators pretty much had their master schedule set prior to this announcement. How have their sites been impacted? If after five days or 30 days or 50 days or 90 days, families who signed up for 180 days of edgenuity realize that it does not serve the students, what will happen? And does the district see this as being an area of concern? Other districts have their stresses, but they are not dealing with this added layer. We are opening tomorrow and my address tonight reflects the confusion, frustration, anxiety, and whiplash that our teachers have experienced over the past three weeks because of this district decision. I wanna end on a positive. So I want to assure the board that our members will do everything they can to serve all students. We have a history of doing this and despite this terrible time, we will do our job in serving the students of Castro Valley. Our leadership team is committed to working out kinks with CVUSD. Just Monday, we approved of a new MOU, uh, which changed the virtual academy middle school schedule because it better serves students. We will continue to work with CVUSD and we come from the, and we come from the perspective of what is best for our students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Can I get your line? President Whitaker, yes. um, I would like to ask for a point of privilege. I wanted to um, just say a few words. Of course. Um, of course, uh, Ms. Robin Fink already covered this, but I just wanted to assure everyone that over the past few days, we've received several inquiries regarding our paraprofessionals uh, returning to work on site. Uh, paraprofessionals play a critical role in maximizing the learning opportunities for every student. Um, as you know, at this point, students are distance learning and are not on campus. Um, we want to assure you that we take their, our employees' um, safety very seriously, and our team has worked hard to implement safety protocols that follow guidelines from CDS um, and the Alameda County Department of Public Health. And supervisors are also working to, uh, with employees on alternative work locations on site if more space is required. Um, but since the beginning of the summer, we've been transitioning staff back to work and have taken care of um, safety needs. Uh, due to the unique and varied nature of the classified jobs, um, work doesn't always transfer, what, transfer well for all job uh, classifications uh, to remote work. Uh, though uh, certificated members um, and staff have an option to work remotely, um, we know that we still anticipate many of our certificated staff to teach on site um, without children in the classroom, uh, from their classroom where they have all their materials and other resources. Our paraprofessionals are needed to support all of um, our students and certificated and administrative staff on site. For employees who have medical or childcare concerns, we have been working with them individually regarding leave options and accommodations. Um, and I just wanted to share that we are continuing to make, make adjustments, as um, Ms. Fink said, as we better understand the nature of this, this disease as well as the need for our staff and students. We are really proud of our strong relationship with CSEA and are committed to working with them to support our classified staff and the great work that they do. Um, over the summer, as Ms. Fink um, noted, the district and CSEA met and negotiated an MOU that further clarified safety pro procedures and training. We are meeting next week, as she said again, continuing to collaborate and negotiate on ways to further support the work of our paraprofessionals. So I wanted to just share that 
um, in case we have some folks who wanted to make public comments to, um, you know, to hopefully respond to some of the um, concerns if that's what the public comments are about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carvey. And thank you, Robin and Mark. We will move on to public comment for items not on the agenda, item five, and I do see some hands raised. So just to be sure, for those of you who are raising your hands, make sure it's not part of another agenda item or items not on the agenda. So I'm going to um, allow Kathy um, Estahar to talk first and then followed by Marissa Kleinrock. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Kathy. The floor is yours. And it's Esh Sahar, sorry. I know sorry. lots of hard in the last thing. Uh, thank you all for your time. As a paraeducator, I'm able to do my job remotely as I did last spring. By forcing me to go and work on site, I'm putting my life and the lives of other classifieds that cannot work remotely at risk. As a CSEA member, we have a broad group of classifieds and there is no one size fits all. We want to change the wording on our MOU that deals with different groups of classifieds, getting the work, uh, workplace assignment based on their needs. Many CSEA members were also not even sent emails regarding the votes for the MOU, meaning that the entire vote should be nullified. Out of the 343 CSEA members, only 90 were able to vote, which comes out to 26% of total members. Out of this 26%, 62.9 voted yes, which is only 57 members. We are requesting for a new contract and a revote. We just want equity and fairness across the district with safety as the number one priority. We all have a duty as a community to limit the spread of this virus. If we are able to work just as effectively virtually, then forcing in person for no reason is a surefire way of purposefully endangering every employee as well as their entire family. Most of us live with severely immunocompromised people, so going into work is a life or death decision. All we want is to work without putting everyone at risk, and we are able to do so from our computers at home. Thanks again for your time. Thank you for your comment, Kathy. I'm going to mute your line. I'm going to move to um, Marilisi, followed by Netta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, for sure. Okay. Thank you for giving me the time to speak. It has come to my attention that the district entered into a contract with the CSCA with the requirement that classified staff, including paraprofessionals, custodians, and office staff, must remain on campus during distance learning. This is unnecessary and extremely offensive to our classified employees. Their health and safety is not being taken into consideration. Many of the classified staff members are also parents who have children in the district that are required to be at home during distance learning. These parents will now be required to find someone who can watch their children and oversee their distance learning, which is an unnecessary cost for parents and is also another possible COVID exposure in their home. These staff members who are able to work remotely will be coming on campus and exposing themselves to numerous others greatly increasing the probability of contracting the virus and taking it back home to their family. As a community, we should be protecting these workers. The numbers in Alameda County continue to rise every single day. Now more than ever is the time to play it safe wherever we can. I'm a parent of two special needs children in Castro Valley District. The fact that teachers are allowed to work from home, but paraprofessionals are not, is infuriating. Paras are underpaid and underappreciated, and this contract requirement proves that. There is absolutely no reason paras cannot work remotely. Many paras also have children or other family members that they need to protect. The options that are being given to risk their life by working on campus or take four months of unpaid leave are downright appalling and show just how little classified employees' lives mean to the district. Our children both have one-to-one -one aides. Distance learning has already been an extremely difficult situation for them, especially with the lack of leadership from the district in regards to special ed oversight re regarding distance learning. As I mentioned, I still have not heard from our daughter's special ed teacher, and we have no links to Zoom calls or to a Google Classroom 16 hours until school starts. When they are having their Zoom visits with their aides, their aides will now be required to wear a mask during the entire session because they'll be on campus in a public building. With our children being nonverbal, they rely on many modes of communication, one of them being facial expressions. How are they supposed to be able to comfortably communicate with their paras with two communication roadblocks, masks and virtual communication? 
If pairs were allowed to work from home, the mask would not be necessary and it would be much easier for our children to understand their one-to-ones. In addition, students whose aides are not able to work on campus due to health reasons, whether for themselves or their family, will then be placed with a substitute aide that does not know anything about that student. If you were to allow the para to work remotely, this would not even be an issue. We do not need to make things more challenging on our vulnerable children. I urge you all to reconsider your position and reject this contract. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Alice. We're going to mute your line. Hand it over to Netta next, followed by Pablo. Yes. Hello. Netta, you're you're on. Full doors. Thank you. I am grateful to our school board and district for doing their best at this crazy time. And I'm grateful to you for really listening and hopefully acting on what you're hearing. And what I really ask is that you put yourself in the shoes of your staff. Due to the pandemic, most companies have policies that anybody who can work from home should have that ability. Requiring classified staff who will be doing virtual work to go to the office feels negligent to me. When we attend these virtual board meetings, we can see that everyone is not at the district office or you know, at work, that many people are at home. And I don't understand how their staff can be told to go to the office if the board cannot meet at the office. So to me, it's just really a matter of equity. If you are able to work virtually, then that should be a, an option. I understand that some people may need to come in and you know, that's fine, but the less people that are on campus, the less risk for everybody. So it doesn't make sense to me from a public health standpoint to require people to come in who are doing virtual work. Just from an equity standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. There are no children at the district office, but yet the board is still meeting at home. This is not a question of whether or not the children are at school. This is just general public health people being at school. So, you know, I really want, hope that you guys can really understand that and take that into consideration. And I also see that communication is a really big problem here. Um, there are classified staff who have not been approved to work from home is my understanding, even though they're following the MOU and I'm concerned about that. Um, you know, I don't know what's involved there, but hopefully that can be clarified next week during their bargaining. I'm really thrilled to hear that the union is still bargaining with the district and under discussion. And I hope that these things are all taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to meet your line, Netta, and open it up for Pablo, followed by Sarita. There, can you hear me? Yes, Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm gonna, uh, I absolutely agree with, with uh, everyone that spoke before me. Uh, I'm gonna address uh, uh, just for a second what, what uh, Robin said regarding the CSA and, and how the vote was ratified. I agreed it, it was ratified. I don't think it, it, it's, it's about nullifying anything, uh, but it was ratified by 16% of the, of the members on the, on the union. I, I think that, that we just need to understand that it was 57 people and that's 16 percent. There was not enough communication. I don't think that everybody knew what, what was in the stake and most of the parents and didn't have to go to work. Uh, I, I also don't think that we, we need to cancel any contract or anything. We just need a, a simple change in the wording. The, the classified employees are absolutely necessary employees and they need to be at schools when they need to be. But the employees that are actually working with the students, uh, when the students are there in the classroom during instruction, those employees need to work virtual because the students are at home. So what they need to go to, to school to work virtually there, like uh, uh, the parent, a parent was saying, I think Kathy, uh, with a mask on so that the kids are not going to be able to, to see them. And, and I, I just think that is, is that I just think that some, somewhere in the line we have overseen uh, these few members that work in the classroom during instructions. And, and I think that that is, is great news that you guys are going to, to re reconvene the bargaining and, and, and see if we can change that uh, to keep everybody else that needs to go to the school safe. Uh, regarding what Ms. Samadhi said about the accommodations offered, uh, I know of many paras that have presented a doctor, doctor's note 
that that say that they are at risk or their family is at risk and they cannot go to work and they still they they have only been offered the leave they have not been offered tele, telework or, or work at home when they're actually going to do their work virtually on a computer uh, at, at the at the site anyway i think that that needs to be a, a change and like i said i don't think we need to redo the contract or anything it's just a change on the wording saying those members that 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 work in this in the classroom during instruction with the students until the students go 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 back to the school they they need to keep being virtual so please don't come to school let's keep everybody else safe thank you so much for hearing thank you for your comment pablo i'm going to meet your line I'm going to move it over to sarita followed by samantha brown Hi, Lavender. Hi, Sarita. The floor is yours. Hi, my name is Sarita, and I'm a parent of two CVUSD students who are about to start kindergarten and second grade. Earlier this week, we learned that our paraprofessionals are now required to be on campus. While I understand there may be a need to have some level of staff, such as custodians on site, I'd like to know why our paraprofessionals that can work remote are not being offered the option to do so. They have proven the ability to successfully execute their roles fully remote. Requiring them to now come on site will not only jeopardize their health, but the health and safety of their parents, children, neighbors, and our Castro Valley community. Furthermore, this will inevitably increase the volume of employees and traffic at this school, increasing the risk of transmission to classified employees that are mandatory on site. We are in, in the midst of a novel global pandemic. Is it really necessary to have employees on site when they have a proven track record of successfully executing their job duties at home? California is sadly one of the epicenters across the country and Alameda County has consistently remained on the state monitoring list. As parents, we are asking and pleading with you to please allow our paraprofessionals the option to work remote. They feel that they have been in the dark and left abandoned. To put this in perspective, less than 35% of classified employees voted and actually had a voice at the table. I am not sure where this breakdown in communication happened, but in my heart, I trust that it was unintentional and that it is not too late to fix. Our paraprofessionals are passionate about, about what they do and they love our children. We don't want to lose them. They also want to be on campus with our students, but like our teachers, they want to only do this when it is deemed safe. We continue to be told that this is a year where we will need to have flexibility and be ready to pivot at any moment. This flexibility and pivoting needs to go both ways. Please, let's show them support, listen to their voices, and consider revising the agreements. I love the core value of what our district stands for, but when we say all, all truly needs to be mean all. Thank you in advance for your time and consideration for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Sarita. I'm going to mute your line. We're going to move to Samantha Brown, followed by Sierra Randall. Hi, this is Samantha. Can you hear me? The floor is yours, Samantha. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Amadi, esteemed board members, colleagues, and community members on this call. My name is Samantha Brown and I'm the parent of an incoming freshman, staff member going on my 13th year at Castro Valley Unified and CSE chapter secretary. I feel compelled to speak tonight to share my concern over all employees returning to campuses during this pandemic. I have had many conversations over the last several months and days with my fellow classified staff members who are concerned about returning to campuses. Alameda County and approximately three quarters of the state are on the watch list due to elevated disease transmission criteria. In the last 14 days, we have experienced 3,000 new cases in Alameda County. As recommended by the COVID-19 industry guidelines documents, one of the ways to reduce transmission is for employers to allow modified work schedules and telework for those who are able to do so. This will allow staggering and uh, distancing as necessary. By allowing flexibility, employees can do the critical work to support our students while maintaining their personal safety and the safety of others who cannot work outside the campuses due to the nature of their work. Many of our staff members are high risk themselves and have family members who qualify as high risk. It makes no sense that people should be required to take leave when they are willing to work. Those who take leave require subs and subs need to be paid. 
I don't understand why we're spending money on staffing because of a rigid policy that doesn't apply to all of the CVUSD staff. The staff members I have spoken to want to work. They are the experts in their areas of business and also want to be safe in doing so. I urge you to please consider extending remote work options and hybrid flexible scheduling to be expanded to the classified staff as it is for the teaching staff. I look forward to the next meeting between CVUSD and CSEA to continue to work towards mutual re resolutions on this and other issues as they arise. If all means all, then please include all. Let's do this together and in a safe way. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. I'm going to mute your line. I'm going to have Sierra Randall followed by Debbie Vanderbilt afterwards. Hello, Hello Sierra. Good evening, everybody. I am Sierra Randall. I'm a special day class teacher at Stanton Elementary School. I am very concerned about my paraprofessionals returning to work tomorrow in person. Um, at currently, our school, Stanton, does not have any power except for in the staff lounge and the front office. This means that all paraprofessionals are going to have to congregate in this one small area where it would be very challenging for all of them to social distance. I have three paraprofessionals in my class and the other SDC class has three and additional paraprofessionals work on campus. I'm so worried about them being in a small room together, yet alone, they'd all have to wear masks as well. How are they going to connect with our students when they won't be, our students won't be able to see their mouths moving, won't be able to see their full faces when this is a crucial time, especially for our students with special needs to make connections and be comfortable with going to school online. I'm also really concerned it's going to be really noisy in the room. Having six plus adults in one room together, it's going to be challenging for our students to concentrate and hear, hear and focus on one staff member at a time. And ultimately, I'm worried about their safety. I don't understand why paraprofessional lives are not as valued as teachers' lives as we've seen now. And it, it really just baffles me that they are being required to go in, in person to work. I understand that other classified employees are as well, but they're not being ushered into one classroom together or one room. Um, uh, Ms. Amati said that they don't, it might not transfer well, the work doesn't transfer well to work remotely for paraprofessionals. However, this isn't true. We've seen paraprofessionals work very successfully at home when they are working from the safety of their home. And I think that this needs to be considered. I thank you for your time. And I really hope that the board and the district reconsiders having paraprofessionals go in person to work. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Sarah. I'm going to mute your line. We're going to have Debbie Vanderbilt next, followed by Bill Toroli. Hello, Debbie, the floor is yours. It's me again, Debbie Vanderbilt, with a daughter going into the Roy Johnson Transition Program. And I thank everybody for being here. It's uh, still not clear on the 100% distance learning option for Roy Johnson when hybrid starts. Susie Williams did tell us that the district is working on the details, and I really appreciate that. I did ask if we were going to have a different teacher for virtual learning, and I was left with the impression that this is being worked out and that we will possibly have a completely different teacher, but I'm not really clear. Uh, the rest of the general population does know that they will have a virtual teacher when the hybrid model starts. And I would really like to know if that's the case, who our teacher's gonna be, and I would rather have the virtual teacher start sooner than later. Susie did say that they were interviewing uh, teachers for that position, and they were doing the evaluations because they have to have advanced technology uh, uh, capabilities. So I'm hoping that this is being worked on and that we will get information sooner than later on who that teacher will be. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you for your comment, Debbie. I'm going to mute your line. Going to have 
Bill Taroli followed by C. Fletcher. Well, Bill, the floor is yours. Hi, I think you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I obviously plan to say a lot more about EVSC, the, the comments uh, that have already been made, particularly by Ms. Amadi, um, are heartening. I'm glad to hear that talks are going to be ongoing with the union. I do wonder what this means for day one, because clearly the conversations are ongoing, despite the fact that we will be beginning. So I am wondering, will staff still be mandated to be on site until uh, an agreement otherwise is reached? Because it certainly sounds that way. Uh, but otherwise, I'm, I'm heartened by that. So rather than add more of the same to that, I actually was rather jarred, uh, to be honest, by the comments from CVTA in their report. Um, I applaud the district, to be quite honest, that we have options available to us, perhaps even if other districts choose not to do so. I think that for a lot of families, including my own, this option provides us safety for a variety of reasons, not just for the one that the union seem to want to call out. Uh, and I think it's myopic of them to not consider other reasons families might choose to do so. I think it would be useful for them to get some additional perspective before they wanna comment on why families would choose this. So I'm rather looking forward to the start of the school year with CVP, and I hope that all staff can get on board with that and help us all be successful. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to mute your line. Going to um, bring up C. Fletcher followed by, by Huma. All right, C. Fletcher will come back to you. Huma. Uh, Huma, you're on mute <laughs> on the left hand side. Still can't hear you for some reason. No. Can see your mouth moving, but not hear your voice. I'm sorry. Do you want me to take you offline for a minute while you work out your stuff and then we'll come back to you? Okay, great. Oh, wait, there you are. Why don't you go ahead, Huma? I think I can hear you now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Let me just um, get back to where I was on. Okay, I just wanted to, um, I'm a paraprofessional in the district. I'm also a parent to two school age children. Um, I'd just like to read some of the snippets from my letter to um, the school district. And Huma, if you could speak up, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Um, I'd just like to read some, snip, um, some snippets from my letter, letter to the district that I sent on Monday. Um, so, dear Superintendent Amadi, directors, administrators, and district office staff, um, I'm writing to you as a Castro, Castro Valley Unified School District parent uh, with incoming sixth and eighth grade graders to Canyon Middle School. And I'm also the para, a para, para professional. Um, at Jensen Ranch, I'm so sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, uh, today we are finding out, this was sent on Monday, today we're finding, paraprofessionals are finding out that we are expected to be on site as school starts this week. Most of us are very confused and surprised as we slowly are getting this information disseminated to us so close to the start of the school year. I personally have not received any communication from the CSEA that represents classified staff members despite being a fully paid up member. I was not aware that um, voting was taking place. Um, I have also spoken to a number of my colleagues who are paraprofessionals as well. Um, they also did not receive emails from the union. Um, and also with the limited information that was coming from the district, we had all been under the impression that um, as had been afforded to teachers, we would be given the same respect and courtesy to work from home and support the kids that we so love working for. Um, many of us have school aged children um, and a lot of us are shell shocked. We feel sidelined. We don't feel like we've been heard. Uh, we're very, very upset. 
um, I'm very disappointed there's been no accommodations allowed um, and no, no information coming from our direct supervisors and site administrators of that enabling us to work, enabling us the, um, to be able to work out an individual sort of equitable work situation that would allow us all best to serve the students we love. Um, while I understand that there are some classified staff whose job descriptions do not allow them to work from home, for example, custodial staff, we as para educators who work directly with students are able to support them virtually, um, which is what we're going to be doing anyway if we're asked to come on site. Um, I, for one, not convinced it's safe and um, I have to decide if I'm going to put my family first or the district first. Thank you for your time. We just want equity. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to mute your line. I'm going to have C. Fletcher. C. C. Fletcher is available. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> My name is Cheryl Fletcher, and I'm a special ed teacher at Castor Valley High School. I'd like to start by thanking the board and uh, the CVTA for their hard work in getting us ready to start school tomorrow. There are two uh, areas of inequity that I'd like to address. Both are significantly impacting some of our special education employees, as well as sped ed uh, families. The first is that to date, uh, SDC parents have not been given a year-long option for keeping their children at home and away from dangers posed by the COVID virus. I do totally understand that this isn't an easy issue to resolve at any level, but it, it, it feels like absolutely no real effort has been extended towards making a decision or seeking a resolution. The inequity is this. Gen Ed and resource students were offered a year-long option that just happened to include the Edgenuity curriculum. Families could take it or leave it depending on their convictions or circumstances. SDC students were not offered a year-long option, period. There are SPED students and family members who absolutely cannot take chances with this virus. And frankly, this is stressing them out. Uh, the second inequity is requiring our hardworking, underappreciated paras to go to campus to work. With the exception of essential workers, uh, our community is still being advised to stay at home whenever possible. And though the paras work is essential to teachers and students, they are not essential to the public at large. And neither teachers nor students are impacted by where the paras work. Uh, we just want them to stay safe and while they're doing the work that's required of them. Perhaps uh, if, so, if a para needed to be on campus briefly uh, or, or if somebody was needed for a few hours, there could be a rotation that would minimize their time on campus. Sadly, there's a really ugly implication in requiring our lowest paid and least recognized workers to do something that their bosses on all levels aren't required to do. As a school community, I believe we need to walk the talk of equity and equality and all means all. Thank you very much. Thank you, I'm going to mute your line. Now we are just about at the 30 minute mark and we have, I have five other hands that I saw raised. I uh, just wanted to make sure that the board is okay with extending um, with five more. Just want to see if I can get a thumbs up from the board. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay, great. So I will move to Jasmine. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Or is yours, Jasmine? Hi. Um, my mother is a paraprofessional and I felt compelled to join this board meeting to speak for her and all of her colleagues. When she told me that teachers and other professionals across the district were able to work from home, I was appalled at the way this organization is treating its paraprofessionals. There is absolutely zero reason for them to communicate with students virtually from on-site at school versus from the safety of their own homes. 
not only does this put the lives of these employees at risk, but also puts everyone in their households at risk of the virus. This is a huge unnecessary risk that affects the community as a whole and can be completely avoided as paraprofessionals are able to work effectively from the safety of their homes. I'm extremely disappointed that my mother's employers don't value her life enough to take basic safety measures to keep her, our family, and frankly, the entire neighborhood safe from this deadly disease. It's beyond careless and completely avoidable. I urge you all to do better and seriously reconsider this mandate. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm going to mute your line, Jasmine. And I'm going to call up Esther um, Capote. Esther, you're on mute. Hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving me this time to speak. Um, my name is Esther Capote, and I am a paraprofessional in the Castro Valley District. Um, I would just like to say that I support my fellow coworkers in this matter to make sure that we are able to stay safe during this pandemic. And I also agree that we are able to do our jobs from home, just like we were able to in the spring with um, complete success, able to help the teachers, able to help our students. And um, I just feel that it's unnecessary and negligent for us to go onto campus to work when we were able to do it from home um, in the spring, like I said. And we, I, as far as I know, we had no issues. And I know with my teacher and my students, um, it was successful. And um, just in closing, I'd also like to say that I really appreciate the community's help with this and um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to mute your line. Actually, Amy, could you help me with, oh, there you go. Um, and bring on Erica Hoffman. Can you hear me? Or is yours. Okay, so I my name is Ellen Hoffman. I have a daughter, Erica, who attends the Roy Johnson program. And I too share my concern tonight about the fact that we are, as of right now, do not have any full year option set and ready to go. A lot of our children or young adults that are in this program transition and changes are very tough. I think it's unfair that the general population already has a program set, albeit not perfect. We don't even have that. We're starting in with the teachers that teach the program and then eventually maybe we'll have a program. To me, that's unacceptable. All is all. And our kids in the SDC classes deserve the same consideration that has been given great consideration to the general population and we should know day one, if not within a few days of school starting, what our full year option looks like. My daughter will not be able to return to school this year as a no doctor will let her back on a campus due to her medical fragile condition. And I have nothing to tell my daughter, although I have to keep telling her the way you start may have to change. That becomes a very high point of anxiety for both of us. And I think it would only be fair if the consideration is put forth really quickly and us parents can have a answer to what this is going to look like. Speaking with a lot of the parents, I know everybody is sharing this concern and it is, has everybody on edge. And it's also what is making everybody not satisfied and angry that it's not being done. This is not the way I hope to start the year. I had great hope that special ed for once would be in the forefront of a, a thought process, not the last as always and most often forgotten. I appreciate your time tonight and please, please, please consider getting this done sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring on Jenna Brady. Jenna, you're on mute. Hi there. Hi. Um, 
My name is Jenna Brady. I am a paraprofessional, a special education paraprofessional in the Castro Valley Unified School District. Uh, on Monday morning, my coworkers and I received information that we were required to work on site this starting this Thursday, uh, August 13th, 2020. Uh, and this was extremely shocking to us uh, because we had not received any prior information regarding CSEA's negotiations for the 2020-2021 school year. Upon looking into this further, we found out that another coworker from another coworker that a vote was being held to ratify the MOU in which the deadline was 12 p.m. on August 10th. And we learned of this deadline at 11 a.m. Uh, my colleagues and I have actually still received uh, no information regarding the MOU uh, or the vote about it, um, other than our emails after this vote to our union representatives. In the past, CVTA and CSEA have had such close values and have both shown their members respect. Naturally, we assumed that our representatives would fight for us to have the same or similar rights as the CVTA awarded its members. In this assumption, we were mistaken. While the CVTA has been consistently updating its members, we received nothing. While the CVTA members were listened to and advocated for, we were overlooked. How are we supposed to fight for education, the education of our students when we have no one to fight for us? The very nature of classified work can be vastly more diverse than that of certificated teachers. And there is no one size fits all solution for all classified staff. For example, custodial crew has no flexibility as to whether or not they can be on campus. However, it would, wouldn't it not be putting more people at risk, including those on the custodial staff, to have more people on campus when some could be working remotely? PPE and social distancing aside, more people means more risk. Considering this, we're asking our union to help us find a more equitable solution. As paraeducators, we demand to have our needs heard. Uh, we have since learned that uh, there are 343 members uh, CSEA members in the Castro Valley Unified School District, only 90 of which voted. Uh, that's 26%. What we're asking is for uh, our voices to be heard by our union. We're asking uh, for more flexibility to uh, keep ourselves and our family members safe, um, as well as all of our coworkers who don't have the option to work from home. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Jenna. I'm gonna mute your line. And our next comment will be from Brent um, Shodetsky. Um, hello. Uh, I jumped into this late. I just realized about the meeting and I didn't realize they were talking about such a, a more serious issue as a father of um, two children who don't require any sort of special education. I feel um, kind of uh, like I don't even have a place to speak here, but just judging from my experience between how this has all gone, um, I just wanted to voice that um, this has been really, really disappointing from all of the board. I've sat in on every meetings and so far I'm not seeing any of the things that have been promised and it really uh, worries me for the safety of the students and faculty, especially um, those who don't have parents who are able to work from home or parents who may have lost their jobs or just having a tougher situation than others. Um, I think it's really, really, really disappointing the way this has been handled. And um, I think you guys need to work extra hard to rectify this. Um, definitely gave you guys the benefit of the doubt um, early on, but we've had more than ample time to learn even just how to register our children. And here we are, 13 hours before the start of school and we still don't have complete information. So my heart goes out to those awesome teachers and um, everyone who's genuinely and rightfully so concerned about their well-being. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments, Brent. I'm going to mute your line. So, um, we're done with our commenting period, but um, we normally don't respond, but Parveen, um, I figured that you wanted to say a couple of words. Yes, I do. I just want to clarify a few things. Um, number one, I think in my comment, I did mention that not everybody can um, actually work from home. So one of the um, speakers mentioned also that there's no power at Stanton, except for a couple of rooms. Actually, the majority of the campus has power um, and uh, the rest will soon too. Um, I wanted to um, just say a couple of words about the safety protocols that we follow that are very strictly followed 
based on the guidelines from CDC and Alameda County Public Health. I have said that before. We have been here since day one. There are people working, but we're all following all the guidelines very strictly, and we make sure that everyone has a safe space to work. Um, we acknowledge uh, that there are concerns and, and some folks can't, and we have made accommodations uh, for people. But I do um, also want to just um, say a couple of words about special day class. Um, I wanted to make sure that you have the right information and, and um, the folks who were um, actually asking that um, SDC students were, um, the families were told that they would not have to return to school um, this year and they can be virtual. Um, ingenuity is not appropriate for um, SDC students and that's why they will have their own, the program that is appropriate for them based on their IEP and there is no reason for families who feel their students can't return to school um, that they would have to. So there is a full year option. It's just different than ingenuity and CVVA because it's not appropriate for many of our um, students um, in this um, special day class. And um, kind of, you know, uh, if I want, just wanted to make sure to say a couple of things to hopefully put uh, people's minds at ease. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Amadi. We will move on to the cons consent agenda. I know there was a lot to read, but this is an action item. I move approval of the consent agenda. I'll second. Then moved and seconded. Um, Karveen? Oh, you're on mute. The board policies are in consent. And I did have some um, clarification and questions about some of the board policies. And I, um, I think I um, sent it to you guys later. So I just wanted to mention that there were a couple of places where um, it was suggested that where, where it says local health officials that we add county. Um, and where it says, um, for example, shall consider student parent guardians and community input. Um, staff was not included to add that. Uh, and just a couple of other places. Um, the question was, um, oh, for board policy 4113. Um, where um, if we, when specifically um, authorized uh, by law or regulation, the superintendent or designee may assign a teacher with a different, with the teacher's consent to a position outside of the credential area, um, we usually have that actually and approve it at an open session. So I just, we added, adopted at an open board meeting to be accurate. Uh, the recommendation to change um, low income to economically um, disadvantaged um, and ac academically challenged. And the last thing um, was board policy, or actually it's in the AR um, to kind of change that same language for um, historically marginalized um, to historically marginalized instead of um, uh, the wording that we had. I think that was that was it. There were two things for the child nutrition one that we had accidentally um, deleted, and they will actually be ba uh, added back on. And it was about using um, organic. Um, uh, the board supports sustainable organic agriculture. Um, therefore, we will develop and implement a plan to integrate organic produce and things like that. And the next statement said that we expect a re we ex uh, the board expects a reasonable and practical attempt um would be made to get for uh, to purchase fresh fruit within the state of california um and increase local produce procurement where practicable so thank you Barbie. we went ahead and added those so if thank you're okay with all of that um we can make those adjustments gary you had your hand raised yeah, you know, those are a lot of changes. So, you know, I'd sort of like to withdraw my motion and suggest that we table these and bring them back when they're done. Sure. 
we can actually what you could do is you could approve the first reading and we bring it back to you for the second reading because usually you do first and second at the same time or we could just bring bring it back for a first and second at the same time we could do that for next time whatever you like we can do yeah i was just looking in the agenda it doesn't indicate first or second reading at all it just said recommends approval i think yeah, and you normally can say first reading or second reading. Um, we don't put it on there so that it's your choice. No, I, I would support Gary in, in pulling this now and bringing it back in our next meeting. No problem. That we can just read it all together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I will send you the, I sent you the changes, but we'll just correct them and then bring them back. Okay. Uh, so we have a revised consent agenda. So do we need to withdraw the motion and then make a new motion on the revised consent? Okay. Well, I will withdraw my motion and move that we accept the consent agenda except for the board policy. Policies. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0. We will move to reports, discussion, and action items to uh, item 7A, approve the 45-day budget revisions for 2021. Thank you. Um, so uh, the Governor Newsom signed a 2021 state budget on, uh, on June 29, um, while our 2021 budget was adopted um, on June 25th. Bef and this is before the state uh, budget was approved. Uh, I know some folks might be wondering why we adopted a budget before the state did, and that's because we are required to have an approved budget by July 1, whether we have a state whether there's an approved state budget or not. And so I just wanted to just kind of, um, you know, in terms of the timing of, of why we have a budget before the state, state approves the budget, uh, before the governor actually enacts the budget. Um, so absent of the state budget, uh, assumptions that we used to build our 2021 uh, budget was uh, from May revise. Uh, if you recall, that's the uh, assumptions that we used. And with the state, now that we have a state enacted budget, we are required to report material changes. And that's why we're reporting to you a 45 day revise. Within 45 days of when the, the uh, uh, state budget is enacted, we're required to report any material changes. And there are actually uh, material changes to, to um, our budget. And so um, if we can uh, go to the next slide, I'm then going to, um, just a recap, a quick recap of where we are uh, or with the state um, as far in terms of um, our local control funding formula. Uh, so you're familiar with this. And so this is actually a, a um, uh, uh, state, uh, the, the uh, January budget versus May revision and then, all, and then ultimately the enacted budget. So just to kind of give you a sense of where we were back in January, and then what happened in May because of COVID-19 and then uh, with the 2021 with the, the state uh, uh, budget. So if you notice, uh, if you got, uh, if you look uh, down uh, where the statutory COLA, we were, we uh, in January it was 2.29, that was the proposal. And then it, May revision was a 2.31, but it's not going, to, it's not going to be funded. And, and on top of that, there are, were additional cuts. Um, with the enacted budget, it, there is a 2.31, but it's not funded. So I just wanted to kind of just highlight those for you as we kind of go through some, some of the slides. Um, next. So we avoided, uh, actually, if we can kind of go back to the, the uh, previous slide, sorry, um, before we, yeah. So, so we avoided major cuts, uh, but it's still a uh, cut nonetheless, uh, because we have a zero COLA. So every year we get a, a, a cost of living adjustment 
um, and that is uh, uh, money that we use to pay for our you know, increasing uh, costs. So every year we have increased costs, uh, step and column, we have utilities that we need to pay and any other obligations that we, we do. And so what, that's where we actually get, the, uh, we use to, um, to, to pay for those things. While it may seem that we are in a really good position compared to when we, I presented the, the 2021 proposed budget to you, um, while it may again may seem that it might, we might be in a good position in terms of LCFF funding, the impact to us is not in revenue but cash. So this is a very different way uh, in terms of the impact. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is now the deferral. So we're not now think, not looking at uh, revenue because revenue is flat funded, right? So we're we're the same. It's the same level as 1920. 2021 is the same. Um, we are now in this deferral, and you have probably heard it so many times. Um, this is the proposed deferral, uh, so it's going to impact our cash flow. So February all the way through June, they are go. The state is going to hold our cash, meaning they're not going to pay us our apportionment for each month from starting in February through June. And so uh, normally we get our 9% of our, 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 so it's a good, ex uh, an example in February, normally we get a 9%, 9% of our apportionment, but in this case, we're actually going to get just 5%. They're going to hold 3% of that. And then if you look at June, the balance, which is a hundred, uh, the, the balance of our LCFF, we're not going to get, all of it is actually going to be deferred the following year. So if we go to the next slide, this is what it looks like. So, uh, you know, the 9% and the, you know, 3%, I wanted to just give you a, a, a true picture of what does that mean for Castor Valley. So P2, this is the second part, the second uh, half of the year, uh, pretty much from February through June. Uh, the state is going to save some money. So by not giving us cash, right? So how they um, uh, balance their budget is not giving us cash. So that means they account for the money that they're not giving us, right? But uh, so it, the impact to us is in, in terms of cash. So the, what, so, uh, the $2.2 uh, million dollars in parentheses there in, in, uh, in red, those are the dollar uh, uh, amounts that we are go not going to receive. So we expect in February a $2.2 million from the state. We're not actually going to get that until November. So that's why you see this, the, um, uh, the, um, you know, the uh, uh, money there moving from, from February through November of 2021. Okay, so and then of course then follows if you if you look at March same thing we're not going to get until October. Take a look at the last one which is June a 4.23 billion dollars. That's a five million dollars that we we expect the state to give us, but it, we're not actually getting until July. So overall the total is 17.3 million dollars that we should be getting from fe February through June. We're not actually going to get until um, the, the following fiscal year. So um, I wanted to share that with you. Uh, this is a really big um, impact on us. So um, we have options and some of those options will cost us. So in, in terms of borrowing money to, to um, ensure that we have enough to cover our payroll, we have an, that uh, on a monthly basis uh, to ensure that we pay our bills, our utilities, um, anything that we uh, need on our day-to-day -day basis, um, those options again come in, you know, will, will, will cost us. And so that, <laughs> yes. And I know I saw Gary's hand raised. I just want to give him a minute to make a, a question comment. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could describe some of those uh, the loans or whatever it is, because this is a massive amount of cash to lose. This is not funny. You know, 17 million is 17 percent of our annual budget. So, I mean, I'm really worried about this. Uh, can you just describe the loan process or yes. there's a way so we get this? So thank you. So there are a couple of options, well, actually three options that I can um, share. So one of the things that uh, the state would like us to do first is really look at our, all of our other funds. And so we, if we have other funds, this is general fund that we're 
basically, you know, we're, we're talking about. This is where we pay all of our employees, right? We also have other funds where um, it, it, you know, developer fees. Uh, we also, we have maybe uh, reserves. Um, a lot, I know a lot of districts, not, not us that have, you know, set aside some money for, for um, you know, other reserves uh, such as um, uh, it could be for things that they want to, or maybe they, they sold properties, right? So if they sold properties, it sits in a, in a separate fund that they can tap into. We don't have that kind of funding. We don't have that, uh, you know, special fund that we can tap into. So, but, and the, the requirement for us is to really look at what we have available. And the only fund that we have available is really just looking at uh, our deferred maintenance, not sorry, not deferred maintenance, but the other funds where we may have, you know, it could be for bond, you know, for Measure G, and even that there are, you know, strings attached to to that. Uh, we they would like us to to look at, you know, any other funds besides the Measure G, you know, in this case bond funds. Um, so that's one option. The second option is actually to check with the county. Uh, the county treasurer's office to see if they we can borrow from them interest free. Um, the the problem with that is it's not just one district. We're talking about every single district in um, in Alameda County that will uh, need that money. And so we've already heard from the county they'll work with us, but they the, the likelihood of us getting uh, 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 money from them is very slim. Um, the third option is the one that I said, I mentioned earlier about the option is TRAN. So um, this is where we actually get money, borrow from banks and uh, it will cost us because then we need to pay the interest. Uh, there are costs of fees associate, associated with borrowing money, obviously from banks and any other, you know, with personal banking and, and all of that, you, you pay the interest and there's also other fees. And th that is actually the third option, which a lot of districts, actually, I wanna say most districts will probably uh, need to do. So um, we are reviewing where we need to start borrowing, but as much as possible, we will try to avoid uh, uh, that, the last uh, option, um, until we really need it. Because again, we, wa we want to make sure that the interest, we're, we're, we're saving on the interest and the other uh, fees associated with it. Susie, we have two questions, Dot and then Monica and then Gary. Thank you, Susie. Yeah. So, you know, if every district in our county looks to the Office of Education, how do they prioritize who they loan money to? That, that's a good question. Uh, we, it's really first come first serve, basically. So well, I know that there are- uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need it now, yes. So uh, they are, they're aware, and I know that the Alameda County Office of Ed, they're really working with all of us. Uh, the one where we had, um, just so you know, we the first deferral uh, that we had was back just a couple of months ago in June. We didn't get our June apportionment from the state. Uh, we didn't get it until July. So that was a month deferral for us. So uh, one of the questions that the county wanted to, you know, uh, they offered is, to, to assist just because the timing of it, we really did not know that that was gonna happen, right? It was a la very you know, last minute for us. And so um, they wanted to work with us, with the county, but that's only one month. And so uh, a lot, I know some districts uh, took uh, that up opportunity to actually borrow because to make it, uh, to, to um, uh, make payroll uh, in June. But for us, we were fine. We had, uh, you know, we had uh, a really good uh, cash balance. And so we didn't need that. So it really depends on, I guess, really the need and how much. So I, I'd say that that will be the, you know, kind of the basis of how much they have, how much they can afford to, to give to the districts. And, um, if we have other options, I think if, if districts have other options, that's where they want us to, uh, to tap into it's the, the other options. Monica? I thought in one of the budget workshops um, I listened to that CSBA said they had some funding available 
um, to help districts get get through this um, cash shortfall. And also, I, I seem to recall, and I'd have to go pull out the materials again, I thought in the finance um, master's in governance course, there was something about being able to borrow from ourselves essentially and borrow against our reserves in order to get through that. I mean, they didn't generally recommend it, but it seems like this is going to be kind of an extreme situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that's what uh, Ms. Chan was describing, that we borrow from ourselves and our reserve. So it's true, and we are doing that. Yes, so uh, I'm not familiar with the CSBA. Uh, I know that the one something that came up was uh, they were uh, looking into an option for working with maybe banks, uh, lenders that the district can all kind of pull in, uh, but it's not coming from CSBA. No. And we we I don't ha we don't have uh, uh, any uh, other updates uh, from the the first time that they mentioned that. Period. Uh, you know, the state lost $60 billion in the spring. Um, you know, I think they're in real trouble. So it's not just the schools, it's everybody coming to the county and the state to ask for funding. The real worry, though, I mean, we might get through this, although if we borrow from ourselves, that it really isn't going to work because we don't have that much money in our reserves. But what I would really, what I really fear is, are we ever going to get this money back or is this going to become a permanent deferral? Um, the, we are obviously concerned, right? So we're like, this is just for 2021 and it, it, it is being deferred for the following fiscal year. Uh, uh, it depends on how long we are going to be in this situation and this, you know, pandemic. Um, so, we know that this year uh, we're flat funded, right? So uh, it's the same level as 1920, but next year what we're hearing is that uh, prepare for the worst, right? So um, they, they're not gonna be able to keep adding to this, uh, um, you know, deferrals, right? So they're already taking $17.3 million, million dollars from us. If they keep adding, then that means it just takes them longer to pay us back. Um, and so it's one way or the other, uh, whether it's next year or the year after, uh, there's, there are going to be some reduction unless, you know, it turns out uh, around, the economy turns around uh, very quickly. But Susie, I mean, obviously with, you know, the third option being the least favorable option, but maybe something that we need to look into borrowing from banks. Um, we're probably going to be competing for the, I mean, there's always money, but we're going to be competing for the best interest rates and uh, working with particular banks. Do we, I mean, have we already started looking into which of those banks are more favorable to work with, or do we still need to look into that a little bit more? Yeah, so we are, we need to look at that a little bit more because we need to refine our, um, our cash flow. We need to really know how much we need. We are. We do uh, have. You know, at the end of June, we were at eight million dollars in terms of cash. We ended the year uh, even with a deferral. We we had eight million dollars uh, at the end of June, and so we're trying to um, do a two-year uh, cash flow. Um, and then once we have uh, that in place. Uh, uh, that analysis, I should say, then we will start working uh, with our uh, financial consultant to really look at what's available out there, given our really good uh, credit rating. Because that's one of the things that they they look at is our credit rating. They want to make sure that we are able to pay our debts. Um, uh, everything that we, we are doing in terms of our processes, we're following through, board policies, we're doing that. It's just, it's just, uh, just like selling bonds, but this one is obviously different. We're actually borrowing cash. So those are the things that they're going to look at. And our, our credit rating is a, by Moody's was last time at AAA, correct? Yes. Yeah, I was going to say this is this is why sometimes when we talk about the um, reserves and the importance of having reserves. Imagine if we didn't have the reserves that we have, 
even with that, we still have to borrow. Um, I, I, I think that's the piece that we always have to be careful about and make sure that our credit rating is really good. Um, so I wanted to say, um, Trustee Howard um, shared, you know, the number that we had from the state was $59 billion <laughs> short, um, right? And that's the number they gave us. Recently, I did hear, um, we had Kevin Gordon speak to us, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And he said, um, because everyone waited to pay their taxes until middle of July. And apparently folks who are billionaires didn't lose any money and made a ton of money. So that 59 went down by quite a bit, but it's still a pretty big chunk. Um, so, you know, again, you know, looking at who really is losing during this pandemic, pandemic and who's not. So. Okay. Um, do we actually have to take out a loan or is there such a thing as a revolving line of credit for a school district? Kind of like the way you do when you're doing work around your house? How does um, that work? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, no. Um, there, we, there's no such thing as a revolving line of credit. There is another option that you probably have heard. Um, there's actually a waiver for districts who are struggling to get, you know, uh, inter, uh, to borrow money from banks, just be, given their situation, there's a waiver that they can file with the state. Um, just so you know, we're not in any of the, you know, cat, that category. And so that wouldn't apply for, for us. <laughs> Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So um, just uh, highlighting changes from adopted budget. Uh, this is our, our 2021 uh, uh, adopted budget to a 45 day revise. I wanted to just uh, share with you that, you know, that 10% reduction to LCFF base grant that we talked about in May revise um, that's really in our uh, 2021 budget, we eliminated that because, because uh, because of what I, you know, uh, per the uh, state enacted budget, we uh, uh, our funding for, uh, with L, uh, the LCFF it's uh, flat, meaning it's the same uh, level as 1920. So that was eliminated uh, from our revenue, um, or you know what we applied there of 10% reduction um, uh, was removed, including um, if you recall with the 10% reduction we had to put in the federal funds, the one time, we knew that those federal funds were one time, and that's because at that time, they were talking about these two funding sources, Governor's Emergency Education Relief, um, and uh, for us, uh, that was a $1.6 million at that time, plus the HEROES Act, and, and as we all know, that didn't go anywhere, um, and so at that time, $8.4 million, that really helped our um, kind of balance our multi-year uh, to with the reduction, we had to put in these these two federal funds because otherwise we would have had to to identify um, uh, more reductions, a bigger reduction. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Those are now eliminated from the budget because they're not in the uh, state enacted budget. What's included uh, uh, with that eliminate with the you know two items that we've eliminated there um, is now the. Uh, LCFF is at the 1920 uh, levels. So um, I wanted to share that with you. And then the next slide. So that, this is our multi-year. So this is, looks a lot better than what you saw. Uh, you, we had, I had a couple of scenarios um, uh, when I presented the 2021 proposed budget to you last, uh, last June. Now this is looking a little bit better um, and that's because if you look at 2021 and all the way to 22, 23, I'm not going to go through every single one, but looking at, at the bottom line, right? So our reserve for economic uncertainties and that percentage that you see there for 2021, we're looking at 7.51% um, reserve. And then in the third year is 4.15%. And I do want to uh, rem remind us of why we're at 4.15%. 
right? So the reason why we're, uh, we, are, uh, we are able to meet our 3% reserve in the third year, not just in this year, it's also in the second and third year, is because of the, um, because of the mitigation and cost reduction we put in place. So I had uh, in my uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, in June, the $1 million uh, ongoing uh, reduction in our ZBB, through our ZBB process, our zero-based budgeting process, where we reduce budget you know, at the site level, at the department level, we tighten staffing. Um, uh, and then in addition to that, uh, uh, the board approve a 1.2 million ongoing reduction by eliminating unfilled positions. So unfilled positions from management, from uh, you know uh, unfilled uh, classified positions to reducing athletics budget. So that's ongoing 1.2 million dollars. Uh, and then we had the 0.8 reduction. We reduced the set aside for textbooks, and then as well as uh, 700 thousand dollars we reallocated from unrest. Uh, we reallocated positions from unrestricted to restricted programs. So overall, all of that was $3.7 million. That's really helping our multi-year. Without any, if we hadn't done any of the any of those uh, reductions, we will not be seeing a 4.15% um, in the third year. So I wanted just to remind us of, of, of the, uh, you know, the things that we put in place um, uh, to to get us where we are, and it's not. This is not probably going to be not the final budget. Um, we are hearing there are, might be some changes, and so we want to make sure that we have um, money that uh, that we can tap into in case there are going to be some adjustments uh, uh, at the state level. Now, Susie, this um, this multi-year projection do they include the 17 million that's being taken away? No. So that this is the budget. So the 17 million is cash. So I just you want don't to make see sure it. Yet. That <laughs> it was clear that yeah. it looks it looks a lot better, but we're still going to have some yes. issues. So I just wanted to make that. Good, yes, good point. Yes, this is budget. This is not cash. We, we, you know, you, what they don't see here is that we are, um, we, we still need to, to figure out that, that problem or, or come up with a solution for the uh, cash uh, deferral that the state put on us. Thank you. Parveen, Monica, Gary? Yeah, I, I was going to say it's interesting how all of this works for folks who aren't familiar with this kind of accounting is that the state is not allowing us to include that 17 million deferral in here any in any shape or form. But yet it exists. So um, anyway, I wanted to, um, I'll say something afterwards. Monica? I forget, Susie, do you do a cash flow statement for us? Yes, so the cash flow is always included with the um, interim reports and the budget. And so we, that's required as part of the, uh, the uh, budget, any budget changes, budget, budget updates, interim reports that we uh, do, um, that we, you know, uh, that you need to approve. What we can do from now on, just because cash flow is really important, um, that we make sure uh, that um, it's, it's part of the presentation, just so you can see where we are and, and, those, and, and uh, how we're doing uh, in terms of, you know, multi-year. We are now required, not just a one year, what you've seen before in the packet was one year's worth. And the, that's because, you know, there were, weren't any issues before, but now that with a lot of the cash deferrals, we, are, we really need to look at it over a two year period. And that's what you'll start seeing um, uh, the next uh, uh, financial um, uh, presentation. Yeah, because this makes us look like we're doing fine. Correct, yes. But it's, it's, it's not realistic based on what's right. gonna happen with the deferrals and what's gonna happen with our cash flow. Right. Yes, that's correct. Yes, because this is again looking at budget. So we'll have another slide for um, cash, just so you can see where we are. Yeah. Thank you, Susie. Carrie. Yeah. So I mean, this does make us look like we're sort of doing fine. <laughs> uh, the deferrals are a nightmare that's out there, about to happen to us. But even uh, looking at the budget we have. And, and I think this is, it's a very fluid budget, clearly, because 
We don't know what the state's got. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know if the feds are going to do something to support us or not. Um, so we'll have to see how that all plays out. But if, even looking at this budget, we are still spending beyond, beyond our means and slowly losing the small reserve that we have. I mean, on this scale, we've only got, I mean, we're burning about 2 million more a year than we actually bring in. And uh, at the end of 2023, that's only gonna leave us a couple of years of cushioning in there. So I don't know what we have to do, any, that we even could do anything right now, but I think if we, we do need to continue to look for places to save money, especially given the, the uncertainty of the deferrals, but also long-term, you know, our long-term financial situation is not sustainable. So we have sort of two problems. I hate to be so such a downer, but um, it does worry me a lot about our finances. Thank you. Yeah, if there, um, if there are no questions before we end the presentation, I just want to, um, I really want to thank Susie Chan. Ms. Chan is absolutely incredible because I think there's a lot that goes on here that you can see um, and, and she does it graciously and just calmly. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of work to cut three and a half million dollars. And I'm, I'm really, um, I want to commend all of you for um, agreeing to that, for asking for that and for doing that. Because I think um, a lot of districts kind of waited and now they're going to have to cut next year and right now. So um, good for you to make the decisions that you made. But to um, Trustee Howard's point, yeah, I mean, this, and then we keep getting promises that we're gonna get this money and that money. And even when we do get funding, if we have to share whatever funding it is with private schools, and this is for public education, um, that's a huge problem. Thank you, Susie. Monica? Um, Parveen, is that something we've always had to do or is that um, something that's more been an issue under the current federal administration? Because um, it does seem kind of weird to me that we're sharing money with private schools when yeah. it's coming from the government and we're a public school. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I'm so glad you asked that question, but it's because we actually, in the past, we always have to share our services with private schools, but it's based on the number, our, our Title I numbers, and so, uh, Ms. Chai can say more, than, more about that. These funds were supposed to be for public entities and whatnot, but Betsy DeVos decided that it is also important for private schools who have lost tuition, although they charge tuition. So it is, this is very new to us. If it happens to be on the number of student, it's different than what we've done before. If, we, if you really go by the numbers we had before, it's, very, it's a very small amount of money compared to what we will lose if it's based on ADA of every school. Yes, yeah, so um, I do just kind of piggyback on what uh, Ms. Amadi said. Um, for us, uh, it is, you know, the, with the Title I, it is based on the free and reduce. Um, and so uh, a small uh, uh, you know, amount is given to, uh, because of that, the, the, you know, because of the, the free and reduce count that they can, uh, that we're required to, to offer it to them. Um, with this one, it is very different. They're looking at that per, Per, uh, uh, per pupil allocation, which is basically taking all the enrollment of public and private school and dividing the money. And so that is gonna be a huge chunk um, away from, um, from uh, public entities, public schools. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Praveen. Are there any other comments on this item? Thank you for the presentation, Susie, and the clarification. Really appreciate it. 
We have no public comments, so I will move us on to our superintendent's report. Back to you, Parkin. It said that's an action item. That's an action item. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just moving us along without uh, taking a vote, since it is an action item. I'll move, move. to approve the uh, 45 day revise. I'll second. Any other comments? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes by 4 0. Thank you. Now we will move on to Superintendent Amati. Now we will move on. Um, just uh, a lot of the same thing we've been doing, um, you know, meetings at the county, at the state health department, lots of staff meetings, and just working on, with our own team and colleagues to plan for 2021. And I really want to um, applaud our administrators who have uh, honestly um, just not only at the district office, but sites working really hard to prepare for, for this year, as well as our classified and teachers who've worked on planning. Um, we had a couple of hearing sessions with our Latino and African American families that um, got a lot of great feedback from. Um, we did have a parent leadership council meeting last Friday, um, and it went really well. Um, we had a presentation um, about what kinds of things families can do or PTA parent organizations can do outside of school to add to what we're offering just to kind of keep the kids engaged in fun stuff. Um, we had um, Sunday, um, I joined uh, Mr. Howard and a few other community members to um, put together backpacks from Rotary um, that I brought over, we brought over here to, um, to serve our children. So we always appreciate Rotary's support. Um, let's see, I've been uh, working a little bit um, in the evenings, mostly with the, on the ethnic studies um, issue, um, kind of getting together with West Asian studies experts and researchers to prepare for that. Um, let's see, um, I had, um, we've had two sessions that UCSF um, offered and it was really, really great. Today, the second session was actually by three doctors, one who worked with special needs students and children, one who is actually a pediatrician and a teacher at the same time in Oakland Unified, um, and another one um, who is a pediatric uh, pe pediatrician. And they did a really, really great job giving us information um, that, that, you know, just about safety and all sorts of stuff. So I really appreciate that. Um, I helped with registration at Castro Valley High School, and it was so wonderful to see students. We have the most amazing kids. You know, thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. I mean, that's just, I really have to thank our families for raising such beautiful kids. Um, and then, um, actually, when we were putting backpacks together, we had some students as well, and it was nice to see them. Uh, then. We had two. Uh, we have two sessions planned for Google Classroom parent workshops. We had one yesterday, um, and we had over 900 people attend. Uh, Mr. Ko and Mr. Vallejo um, did a great job presenting, and it is um, the recording is being sent to families, um, and we are posting it. Um, so. And all the questions they had, we tried to answer as many as we could, and then the rest of them will do an FAQ. Um, so it's gonna be repeated again tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock. So in case you wanna join us, that's tomorrow. That's all I have. There's a lot going on. I can't list everything. But it's been fun. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent Amadi. I will move us on to board member comments and reports. And I will start with Dot. Uh, well, since the last uh, regular board meeting, I uh, was, uh, attended the um, sub, the ad hoc, no, not ad hoc, the subcommittee for That's policy. <laughs> like, what was that committee name? Um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and that was the only thing really that I've represented the board in. Um, but I did manage to register both of my high schoolers for school this year. And it went so smoothly. Um, the school mint process was 
freight um, after I figured out where my daughter was in the system. Um, it was really smooth. It took me probably five minutes per student. So um, thank you to your, you and your staff for all the hard work in, in setting up that system. I do miss volunteering at registration because that's always so fun to see everyone, but it's nice to know that we have the ability to do it without making everybody come in and printing all of the paper and then dealing with all of the paper. Um, so that's it, that's my report. Thank you, Don. Gary? So, uh, yeah, we don't have that many things going on in a way because there, you know, we don't visit schools or anything like that at this point. Uh, I did attend, though, a Zoom meeting with the Eden Area ROP on their uh, Perkins grant renewal uh, that in, uh, they had to look to all their advisors. And I've been on the Biotech Advisory Committee for over 10 years. So they called us all in to go over uh, ways to support the uh, uh, grant renewal. So I was on with about about 25 teachers from Castro Valley that were career oriented and ROP teachers. It, it, I really enjoyed it. It was about a two hour meeting, but the discussion was fantastic. I added nothing, but the teachers were really fascinating. Uh, they had all kinds of great ideas. Um, I was really impressed by it. I enjoyed it a lot and uh, communicated with a number of them afterwards. One of the things I did see was that they were uh, really asking for uh, um, sort of experts in various fields that support uh, career education to come and speak to classrooms and mentor, maybe offer the possibility of uh, job shadowing or internships and so forth. And so um, I went back to the Rotary Club and uh, we have uh, reestablished the vocational committee at the Rotary Club and have a group of people who are willing to help the uh, the teachers to find those people because we have a huge number of contacts and they are now in communication with the teachers at the high school. And my last thing is to point out that the Rotary Grants period for this, uh, this fall has opened. And if anyone's interested in that, they should go to the Castro Valley Rotary.org website and apply for one of those grants. So thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Gary. Monica. Um, I attended the talking session for the Latin American parents and the African American parents. Um, two separate nights, two separate meetings, lots of really great comments and, and discussion. And Nancy Nodal does an amazing job translating. Um, and then I attended one workshop, I forgot who put it on. Um, on equity in schools that was really very good. I think it was one of the, the companies that just emails us periodically. Um, I think I also, I can't remember when it was because I lost my notes, but it was a budget workshop I went to. And um, the last thing I did, which was not really representing the board, but it was also really interesting was the Charles Houston Bar Association, which is the Black Bar Association in Oakland put a seminar on, on knowing your rights in terms of um, what happens if you're protesting and cops approach you and or if you're just driving while black or something or and that was really fascinating just given the current state of our our country and what's going on these days so that was it thank you monica um i am on the board policy subcommittee with dot so i did review all those um, lots of policies and I wanted to thank Amy again for all of her hard work helping us out on those. Um, I did attend our Latinx and Black Family Nights with Monica. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ryman and his staff for putting that on but I also want to thank the families allowing us to just listen in and hear what's going on. Really appreciate your perspective um, and letting us know what's going on with you and your families. Uh, lastly, I have continued to advocate for ethnic studies by sending a joint letter um, from myself, Mark Sanchez with San Francisco Unified, Pat Murray from South San Francisco Unified, Noelle Corzo from San Mateo Foster City School District, 
Lori Fong um, from Santa Rosa School District and our own Aisha Knowles, board president of the Alameda County Board of Education to San Leandro Twin Rivers, which is in Sacramento and Eureka City School, which I will, I will be, I'm happy to announce they all unanimously voted to approve uh, their ethnic studies resolutions. And this week we're looking to send uh, joint letters to Delano and Fresno. So I just wanted to update you on how that's going. And you're on. Um, yeah, um, so trustee, um, trustee Loss um, was not able to join us, but I know that um, she sent, um, were you gonna go over that one or do you want? Yes, I was gonna go over that next. Um, trustee Loss is not with us today, but she did wanna let us know that she did attend um, the um, R Eden ROP um, scheduling meeting and she wanted to let everybody know that distance learning for the ROP does start on August 17th. And just so that you're aware for the center programs, there is a virtual schedule that they will be adhering to. And that virtual schedule is there is an AM class uh, synchronous instruction from eight to 10. And then there's a 10 to 12 teacher prep student family outreach period, a lunch from 12 to 1230, and there is a PM class synchronous instruction from 12.30 to 2.30. And then from 2.30 to 3.30, um, they have a student support office hours and um, uh, asynchronous work. So um, just wanted to let everybody know that those are the schedules, that it does start August 17th. Really looking to forward to seeing how that works out for kids this year and what they're learning and how they're, they're working out that ROP program to give um, students, you know, learning an opportunity in different ways. So really exciting stuff. Well, with that, we have no further agenda items. I do wanna thank the community for calling in today and their comments. Wanna thank you all for joining us. We hope you and your families are safe and healthy and we wish you a good night.